Hey everybody, welcome back this week. So, so far it looks like not a, not very many people are around this week, so I guess everybody's busy or hiding at home from the snowstorms, out of power or something, or at least around the U.S., but um, hopefully more people will join us here. But for the few of you watching today, at least live, um, welcome and thanks for joining us today. And we will be kind of continuing this week on the, the talk about, you know, how do we design a game and, um, you know, how do we how do we really do it? Like, how do we put that application of the game design, you know, to 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 practice? And so this is this is a challenging thing and that we are, you know, in reality doing, you know, in one month, meaning like, you know, two hours a week, you know, four hours. So we're doing like eight hours of, of work you know, in an entire month, and that's, you know, less probably or what we would spend at a minimum in one day, you know, if we were actually designing this thing in a real um, environment or a real professional, you know, on a team or something. And so it's hard to make progress, you know, when, you know, in reality, a AAA game could take us months and months and months of full-time work, you know, working 10, 12 plus hours a day. I mean, they're, they're, they're a significant amount of work. And so um, you'll see us cutting a lot of corners, see me cutting a lot of corners, you know, throughout this process of, of trying to figure out how do we design a game and kind of show you that process of how do you actually design something versus just kind of talk about it in theory. And so just to kind of recap um, for anybody that's new and hasn't been um, watching us, this is the, I believe the fourth um, part in our series of this particular topic. And this is building off of a previous, um, I believe, six-part series about world building. And so this is kind of a, like, how do we take world building and build a world and build a universe and build an IP um, from scratch and not use a licensed IP? I know a lot of people brought that up last week about, you know, well, we should just, you know, like, why would you ever build something original? Like, go license Marvel or whatever. And yes, there is that, but that's not always an option. Sometimes you're told to do you know, something new and original. And, you know, this is about using your creativity um, and, and stuff. And so for this exercise, we are going to build a game from scratch. And we're going to try to um, build a universe and a superhero IP from scratch. And we're not going to debate anymore whether that's good or bad. That's just the, the process of what we need to do, you know, today, right? And so, um, so bear with me as we kind of dive into, you know, the, the nuts and bolts. Um, I've kind of arbitrarily chosen to, to design a superhero RPG. Um, and so there's been lots and lots of great um, feedback, some amazing feedback from all of you, you know, and um, students or people just chiming in, whatever. Um, thank you all so much again for the weeks past of, of making this a conversation and making this a brainstorming forum and not me just dictating and, and doing things and stuff, right? And so today, please keep that up. Um, if you're here and you're joining us today, you know, live, Please, you know, please, please, please give me feedback and advice and ideas and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, let's make this a discussion and not, you know, just me, you know, totally designing on my own, which is um, very hard on me. <laughs> so, so bear with me. Um, hopefully everybody can see today I switched to dark mode. Um, so trying to adjust my lighting a little bit, trying to make me me um, slightly better looking, but that's hard to do. But, you know, at least we will, um, you know, trying to, to, to make the lighting stuff. My problem is I have a 43 inch monitor in front of me that I work off of. And it, it's great to have such a big screen and all this real estate. And I love it. But in the same hand, I'm, um, it puts out so much light that it blows me out on the cameras. So it's driving me, driving me crazy this week as I've been adjusting my lighting and trying to figure out how to make myself look slightly better. So anyways, I am not going to go through today and try to um, spend time wasting on what we've done in the past. Um, if you guys haven't been here and haven't been keeping up, please go back and watch the, the previous talks. But, you know, in short, we're, we're looking at how to do a Marvel superhero game. We're looking at, you know, things like Marvel's Avengers or Champions Online, things like that. Um, all have pluses and minuses, but in my opinion... I think that there is a, if you look at the, the superheroes, movies, TV shows, um, people brought up The Boys, um, which I, I went and watched, I think, four or five episodes of. Um, so I'm slowly kind of catching up on The Boys, and there's a 
I guess a substance that they're doing or some kind of a substance that affects the superheroes, but the story hasn't gotten there yet for me. Um, but we, that came up about, you know, do, do superhero powers come inherently natural to the characters? Are they born with them? Right. Or is this something that they, that they learned or is it like the incredible Hulk, you know, where, you know, some kind of bad science, you know, bad science experiment or something happened. Fantastic four. I mean, there's lots of those kinds of things where, you know, something bad happens, transforms the person into this thing, you know, this, this superhero, right. For better or for worse. Um, and often with both ramifications, right? Both consequences. Um, you know, are there, is a superhero more like Iron Man, where it's or Batman, where they're technology based? You know, and you're and you're, you know, kind of creating your own superhero. You know, you're just a normal person on the inside, but you know, you're using technology or things to, you know, to fight crime or, or you know, make the world a better place. And um, so. You know, we need to make some decisions today about that. You know, I'm really curious if you guys that are listening, like, have opinions about where, you know, where should superheroes powers come from? Is this something that's, you know, you're, you know, like a Jedi in Star Wars, you inherently are born with Metachlorian and certain things that give you these special abilities? You know, is this something that's, you know, a mutation like X-Men or, or something like that, you know, that's happened naturally again to certain types of people is this you know like where should the powers come from and what kind of generated those powers and um so i'd love to know what your feedback is or what you like or don't like do we want to create you know probably a combination of like maybe it's it's a mix of you know some technology people like you know um stark or whoever you know in um tony stark you know from you know creating iron man um, you know, so some people are using technology, um, either to be a superhero or to fight the superheroes, you know, and other people, you know, maybe it's an inherent ability, but if you have a strong opinion about that, please chime in. Hi, Luke. Good to um, see you here again. Um, yeah, that's a good idea of, I mean, I guess I would call them in this particular case, maybe races. Um, you know, so if you think about like the, the equivalency of a D and D, you know, Lord of the Rings style fantasy RPG, right? And 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 he, in essence, we're kind of taking that as we build an RPG in a superhero universe. Sometimes you can create parallels between concepts, right? And so, um, so I like the idea of like maybe there is a bunch of we'll call them races for now to to use a vernacular that that we're all in agree like to understand, right? And so. Just like elves in Lord of the Rings have inherent natural ability and humans don't. And then, you know, sometimes there's some hybrids and there's 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 things, right? And they all have their different uh, uh, stuff. But I think you know, regardless of that, I think we can have, again, there's there's groups, you know, and we'll call them races that have, you know, no superhero ability. Those are just the mundane. Um, there can be the group that has no superhero ability and uh, technology. There can be the group that has inherent natural superhuman abilities you know and stuff and then maybe let's let's start putting this down on paper now but maybe there is a group of um of maybe it's the scientists or whatever studying i i, I believe i've seen this in some superhero movies so i don't know if this is an original idea in fact i know it's not but just this idea can we study the superheroes you know and can we extract out their um that superhero power, or whatever that is, uh, um, we'll use the word metachlorian analogy right now for those of you familiar with the Star Wars universe and Jedi Knights, and understand that they they kind of changed that analogy. It was it was kind of magical in the first three movies, and then kind of the second three movies they introduced metachlorians, which I really hated, but it's a it's at least a common frame of reference to understand that there's something in your blood that basically gives you that special ability, and so. You know, maybe scientists have extract, you know, are, are, are trying to or starting to or have, you know, whether it's on, whether it's widely known or not, but they're extracting that out and then basically using that metachlorine, using that, that, that reference DNA or whatever it is to make their own superheroes, right? And, um, and that could be, again, maybe it's, um, um, yeah, Luke, I agree. That, that was George, and I, I did not like the whole metachlorian. Trying, trying to explain things that are magical 
sometimes is a really bad idea. And that was an exact, you know, my exact feeling too with, with that. Um, and, um, but that, that's a, that's a great for a little side note, just for game designers. Like not everything has to be explained. You know, some things can be kind of magical, right? And, you know, it's okay just to have kind of a loose thing that there's some powerful beings out there and we're not sure why and all that, like that can be okay to have in your story. Like you don't have to explain every little tiny detail. Right. And I think Metachlorians was again, was a time for me, at least personally. And I think for a lot of people where suddenly a, a, a vague story point that was mysterious and fun and you know, whatever suddenly got explained in some weird analogy that didn't make sense. And just kind of like it ruined it for me. And so so I think that's as a game designer, game developer, you have to kind of be aware sometimes like, you know, you don't always have to explain everything in uber detail, right? Let let people's imaginations work for themselves sometimes. And that's a it's an important point to understand in, you know, in stories. So, um so let's start writing this down. Um So I'm going to put um here So, where do superheroes, um, we'll just do, all right, and we'll say one, um, so, so here is the, um, Hey Max, um, well, I need to know what exactly I thought up by saying that. I'm not sure. Um, not sure exactly what you meant there, Max. I'm sorry. <laughs> please, please specify. I'm not sure if you're referring to Luke's comments or what I was talking about. Um, so please let me know or elaborate on that comment, please. Um, in their DNA or um, something else. And then there is the, um, you know, we'll call these just in parentheses races for now. Um, yes. So yeah, not explaining everything is is okay, right? But you have to find that fine line. You don't want people to be confused either. Um, so I. Um, and again, we are we are using just um, a like. Um, hey Jorge, how's it going? Um, thanks for joining us today, all the way from Peru. Hope you're well down there. Um, and um, so, again, you'll see me using a lot of references towards um, Marvel superheroes, DC superheroes. Why do I do that, right? It's because as a game designer, and, and I'm and I'm doing this not just for your live stream, just for you guys. This is something that I use for myself, and this is also um, um, something that the you know as a game designer, right? We need to express ideas to somebody usually, right? We're usually expressing ideas to a team, um, to executives, and things like that. And when you when you need to express an idea sometimes, if you can express it in something they are familiar with, it's a lot easier to understand, a lot easier to explain than to try to have some big complicated analogy and you know then they then they're trying to get the point versus you'd be like, oh it's just like Iron Man. They go, oh okay, I got it. Like nothing else needs to be said, right? So so keep in mind that that common frames of reference, whether it's from video games, movies, books, comics, whatever that you share in common with your team, with yourself or other things like that become really important ways of a common language. It's not just about speaking English to somebody or whatever language you're using, but it's about building, you know, this ability to understand concepts with people uh, much easier. And so as a game designer, using things like, you know, Iron Man or using things that people would get or another game mechanic and like, oh, I want I want this game to, you know, function, you know, I want the, the combat system to work kind of like Halo meets this or, or this meets that, you know, and, and using games and the analogies that people will get that can be a thousand times easier than like going on this long explanation of like well I want the simple fun easy blah 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 and you're trying to do something versus just say like I'm I, I want, I'm starting with Halo right or starting with Star Wars or, or something 
So, um, so hi, Audrey. Hi, friend. Thanks, guys, for um, for joining us today. And again, everybody, please, please, please chime in today. Please, um, you know, join in on this, on this conversation and as we design this the superhero game. And I'll try to not get off on too many tangents. I'm trying to do my best to give you guys a little bit of story, a little bit of context for the method of my madness, you know, versus just sitting here writing stuff without any explanation of why I'm choosing certain things or why the process of why I'm doing certain things is the way it is, right? So Max, God gave them power. So let's put that, um, so we'll make a sub point out of here um, and um, And this could be, um, and I guess to, to elaborate on that, you know, um, so I think that's a, that actually, whether you were meaning this or not, uh, Max, I think there, there is good context there, um, about, think about Greek and, and, um, Roman mythology, right? And so let's even put that in there. Um, oops. Uh, so, so I think that's a that was a slant I hadn't even thought of, and so thanks for for contributing that. That's um, but I think that's a good point. If you wanted to bring in a slant for that, you could decide of again. I try to not get in games. I'm very 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 careful about using God, using religion, anything that can get too political or too you know. Um, Whatever, right? And I don't, so I, I don't want to. I don't want to create a game or, or anything that that gets too religious in that sense, right? But I think that riffing off your idea or taking it, whether you meant it or not, of um, the Greek and Roman gods, obviously there was a lot of stuff there where they they had a lot of powers, and whether you're, you were directly a god or you're a half god or whatever, um, you know, there was there was characters like Achilles even that was almost unkillable or whatever, you know, in, in a lot of that, that ancient mythology, right? And so I think that's fair game and like that's actually really good reference material. And so whether you use that um, directly or not, um, I could totally see doing a like a futuristic spin and um of like Greek mythology, right? I mean, maybe there's something, you know, maybe we create a world where the, the, the Greek and we, we assume that Greek and Roman mythology is true, right? And now fast forward a thousand, two thousand years or several thousand years at least, um, you know, and now it's futuristic, right? So what happens in a world where Greek and Roman gods are real? What happens when they're there? And so like literally, you know, or Viking, you know, Whatever. I mean, there's there's a bunch of different um, what do we call them um, mythologies there, and different groups of mythologies that all have supernatural powers, but they're not necessarily you know the the Christian gods and, and things like that of, of today, right? That get that would get a little too polarized. But I do kind of like this idea, and I do think there was a game that did this at least with either. Um, I know somebody did it with either Viking mythology or something where they had kind of a sci-fi slant on it. So it, it's not 100% um, there, but I like the idea of, of turning it into kind of a superheroes um, kind of project, you know, where you it's not really necessarily God powers per se, but we really present them as like superheroes, you know, and then, oh, by the way, you know, they're the son of Zeus or something like that, right? And so, so you actually could bring in like mythological characters and have Zeus come into the game and, you know, have a whole mythology around that world. But you've, again, fast forwarded, you know, thousands of years and now kind of like your sci-fi with mythology and how do those two clash and work together? Um, you know, and you got Clash of the Titans, kind of big Titan monsters and all kinds of like crazy stuff could be happening. But now you've also got guys with like laser guns running around and giant robot mechs and like that could be an interesting duality that we could play with. So what do you, what do you guys think about that idea? Um, yeah, so, uh, so thank you, Jorge. That, um, um, I think you said, um, yeah, Daredevil was another one. Um, so yes, so there was an accident. Um,
And actually, um, I think that, let me just move this down here. Um, I think that um, Max's idea is good enough to warrant its own bullet point here. I think that could be its own, it really is kind of its own bucket. Um, and then um, we'll call this one created. I'll put it in quotes. Um, so this would be um, um, So, you know, and I don't know, um, I'm trying to remember the, the exact origins of like, um, there was, because I, I would actually, I'd say that Captain America and Wolverine were really more technology. Um, I would, I would kind of put them more in like technology sort of created them, but that's a, that's an interesting one of like created their, um, um, what's well, actually, um. You know, using DNA or such from existing, but I'd also say um, um, incorporating technology. So this would be, you know, um, like Wolverine, and um, something like that. So like with Wolverine, like his adamantium skeleton and things like that that they put into him was um, really a technology almost, you're right. And then, I mean, there's lots of gray areas here, but I think that's, you know, something that's kind of kind of interesting. Let me catch up on your notes here. Um, yeah, Luke, I mean, I, I agree that the um, superheroes always seem to be kind of modern day. You know, most of the most of your IPs are modern day. So, um, um, yeah, the, um, yeah, I think that was the, um, I think the boys was here. Um, so I agree that the, that the, that's why I'm trying to get rid of the modern day. I don't, I don't want this game set in the modern day. Cause I think that's where every other superhero movie kind of starts and granted, you know, some go to other planets or do other things. You know, I was watching Marvel Avengers over the, you know, in the, the couple of Avengers movies and yeah, they're, they're always on other planets and stuff and they're kind of near future and that they are the the technology that like the avengers themselves use and you know and the ships and stuff and the superheroes is kind of advanced but then the world itself is for the most part from what i can tell pretty like you know today's you know era or or something kind of equivalent you know thereof and so um so we just need to be we need to just i think find a new time era and and I we in our very first talk we talked about going to the future and doing something sci-fi and that resonated with everybody so I want to stick with the sci-fi angle just because that was what um, 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 people were kind of leaning towards in the beginning and I'm trying to to you know not just go in the, the way I want to go so so that's why I, I think doing doing a sci-fi version of a superhero thing and going farther in the future where we can have more balance between technology and and the, the the superheroes right and that and whoever the villains are could be using technology or could be using you know superhero powers people could be trying to stop the superheroes using both you know so giant mechs things like that to me are, are really um really interesting let's see here um luke could have japanese supers blessed by japanese gods Romans blessed by Aries, Egyptians blessed by Ra, etc. Yeah, so it could. Um, um, so I'll say here. Um, so yeah, can't spell. So. Um, Oh, I could not spell today. Um, so, Roman, Egyptian, I'll fix it later. Um, and what else you mentioned, um, you know, the uh, Japanese. 
So, all right. And um, so Blasphemer, hidden knowledge like Doctor Strange. I don't remember exactly where his, he had his amulet. And I don't remember if all of his powers came from the item. So that's that would be a, a sixth one here. Would be, um, and I'm not sure, um, Blasphemer, if you can elaborate. Because I don't remember Doctor Strange's origins um, very well. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure about the, um, about that one there, but that just made me think of, um, um, So I'm going to say object or resource. Um, and so we talked about this a little bit last week, for those of you that remember um, this idea that like, you know, you could have a, like even in D&D or something, right? A staff could be imbued with magical abilities, right? Um, or, or things like that. So the, the, the idea of Doctor Strange, I don't remember whether he got his own inherent powers that he channeled through that amulet, which was, I believe, one of the stones, right? Because in the last movie... They're trying to collect, or the Avengers movies, they're trying to get the, the gauntlet with the stones on it. And I remember they had to get one of the gauntlets from Doctor Strange. Um, but I don't remember whether that was inherently his, all of his power coming through that or something else. So it doesn't matter for right now. Um, but I think this idea that, uh, you know, you could have a thing that has magic abilities that you're able to channel. Um, and then I also talked about this idea of a substance, um, Um, you know, the, um, let me see. Um, let's see. One second. Okay. So the objects can channel the power or a resource. Um, and I'm calling it a resource. Um, I used it in a, in a game called Steam that I was making where it was something like a drug almost that you ingest. And when you ingested it, it gave you magical abilities. And so that would be something else that would be, you'd have a limited amount of this superhero power and you get to eat something, take something, do something. And then you have this power for a while and then, you know, you run out once you use it. And then, you know, like mana, right? Like, you know, a lot of the D and D style games, like you might have, you know, inherent stuff ability. And that's actually a good point of this is, um, I'll put a, um, this is kind of part of gameplay, but I don't want to forget about it. So I'm going to throw it in here for now and we'll, we'll move it, um, later, but, um, so, um, so the idea here would be that, um, you know, there's mana or whatever you want to call it, right? There, there is a substance there that, you know, that you need to have that gives you more magical abilities, you know, and you ultimately can run out of it. So you might still have the ability to, you know, i.e. The, the inherent nature of like, yes, I can cast this spell or I can do this thing, you know, that's equivalent, really a magic for lack of a better definition. Um, but do I need the equivalency of mana or some substance or something that, that infuses me with that power, you know, um, um, and so, um, so, you know, does the, does the tech have limits? Like, cause everything you'll, you'll hear me in my course often talk about limiters and limiters is what I call kind of just this ability, you know, like, like the name kind of implies, how do we limit the player for what he's going to do? And so, you know, the equivalency of like ammunition for a gun, right? Like, you know, or having stamina for how long I can run or climb or do certain things, you know, uh, go, if I want to swim underwater, I have, you know, uh, in some games, a limited amount of breath, you know, and I, and I can only hold my breath, you know, for so long or mana when I'm casting magic spells. These are all things that, that limit and, and, and kind of keep the player from just abusing something versus like, you know, are you Superman 
or some equivalency of where I can just go all day long and I'll never, ever, ever run out of energy. I can fly, you know, for a thousand years and nothing's going to stop me, right? And um, so limiters, I believe in games are really important because it makes players make hard strategic choices. And so th this is something that's kind of inherent. This is where, you know, the, the creation of the IP needs to match the, the, the gameplay mechanics, right? And so, so we can come up with an origin um, of like, hey, here's here are these people and here's what they're capable of doing. But if they can do it all day long for as long as they want and all these kinds of things, that can be okay. I mean, but but we need to we need to understand that, right? And need to understand like, you know, do you have a certain number of things that you're going to do? Whether that's you know, um, so let's say like battery, you know, ammo, etc. Right? So. Something that just kind of keeps you from abusing that power throughout the entire game. And therefore, when that power is limited, um, it feels more special, right? So let me do a few more comments here. Um, and thank you guys. These are all really great comments. So really do appreciate you all um, chiming in today. So, hey, Jonathan, how's it going? Um, so... So the Blasphemer, Doctor Strange has his own magical abilities that he learned from, mastered. Um, okay, so the stone was just the time travel. Okay. Now I guess that kind of makes sense because they're in that one of the Avengers movies. I can't remember which one it was now. The the woman, um, the bald woman showed up who was kind of like his counterpart or whatever. And I think they'd already given the, Oh, that's right. It was time travel though. So I think she'd had the stone back. It gets complicated with time travel, but yeah, I was remembering that she had a lot of powers, like where she knocked the Hulk kind of out of his body, so to speak, the spirit of Dr. Banner or whatever, Bruce got kind of knocked out of the Hulk and it was this kind of, um, whatever experience, but I think she had actually the time, the, that stone at the time. Um, so yeah, I guess it's more, um, Inherit of some of their unique abilities with the stone unlocking some special abilities. Um, and actually, that's a great um, a great point here. Um, so, you know, maybe some special abilities are controlled, um, but, you know, maybe, maybe they always have kind of a, a default inherent set of abilities, um, you know, and... Um, things like that. So, you know, um, so you, you might need the item, the mana, you know, and you do see some of that coming up in like the, even in the, the Avengers movies where I remember like Tony Stark almost died. I think at the end of the one, cause he ran out of power. I mean, he was, he was using his jets and whatever and do, doing so much fighting that, you know, they did bring up several times. Like he didn't have enough power or energy to do something. And so that, that was a, that is a valid, like, oh yeah, I mean, yes, you're Iron Man and you, you seem, you're seemingly invincible, invincible, but to a limit, right? You still can't like take on 10,000 enemies and have enough to blast all of them. So he had to get more creative and like what he was doing. And then in the end, you know, almost killed himself, like trying to like, remember, fly the thing back into that wormhole. I guess it was the nuke that the the guy's shot from the plane and he takes it up into the wormhole, which blows up the, the, the aliens. But, you know, he ran out of power when, you know, as he got up there. So that would be an example of a limiter. Um, yeah, that's a good one with the... Um, um, so favor of the gods, like for the mythology... So we don't we don't need an exhaustive list here, but I'm just trying to show you guys that like as I come up with ideas, sometimes you just want to kind of get them down there and understand, you know, that that these while they're not absolutely critical right now to understand, I do think that this is a it's an important part of making a fun, balanced gameplay system. And so if you're if your superheroes in this particular case are all powerful, you know, then you know like they have to have a weakness, they have to have something, right? And you could say the same thing if I was designing a giant mech game or a Godzilla game or whatever, right? If that thing doesn't have, you know, a weakness in it, you know, then somebody ultimately needs to be able to find that weakness, exploit it, you know, and that, that there's, there has to be some threat and some worry about how do I lose, right? And so we do need to be sort of aware that limiters do kind of, you know, make these people not all powerful. We don't want to have, 
especially in this universe I'm creating, I don't want to, I don't want all powerful superheroes, right? Hey Rizzo, how's it going? Um, let's see here. Yeah, so Jonathan, exactly. It won't be fun if you're too overpowered. Um, so I have the alignment, favor of the gods, um, or, um, yeah, um, we'll, we'll just put it in here now, like, player level, you know, um, So I'll say some stuff becomes useless. Um, um, so over time, so so that you know, um, so you know, we'll, again we'll define that you know a little bit, a um, little bit later. But the you know, um, um, you know, again, it's, it's a good point of like having you can have characters, you can have items. You can have anything in this world that kind of have a limited amount of of um, power and capability. And in fact, let's put a note here. Um, we'll go, just call them. And again, we'll we'll just kind of pencil in things as we think of them, right? A, a lot of game design is just about like sometimes falling kind of from one train of thought to another and you don't want to like forget something, but you may not detail it out now, but you don't want to forget about it. Right. And so, so you often see me stop while I'm working, write down a quick note of something, you know, and, um, and then move on from there. And I may come back to it cause it just reminds me, Hey, I need to you know, cover something. Um, so, you know, and again, I want to use the word power levels very loosely here. Um, you know, um, so some characters, um, um, so, so the idea just, you know, again, like, you know, do I have level one characters? Do I lo have level hundred characters? Right. And so as I'm building out my, and I'm, you know, and then, um, um, oops. Um, so, so this is, um, you know, do we have different levels of characters, right? So as I'm collecting characters, you know, and I'm getting things like eventually some become obsolete, you know, maybe, and then other, and that gives me reason to keep collecting more and more and more. Cause I want higher and higher level characters, you know, but maybe they don't, you know, maybe the characters won't come to me. They won't come to my my Avengers team or my, you know, Justice League, whatever group it is that I'm putting together to, to, to get all these superheroes aligned. You know, if I'm just a nobody, they're going to be like, eh, like, why would I come join you? I'm Superman. Like, you know, um, you know, and they walk away. And then eventually if I get maybe my reputation high enough, then, you know, they will come and join me. Right. And so there, there could be, you know, more and more powerful characters. Um, so, um, so, and I think this is a, you know, a big guess. I mean, I think that's just the inherent nature of these kinds of games that you just, you want to have more and more and more powerful characters, you know, and not everybody has to be, um, um, equal right and then i think the can level can the superheroes be leveled up i think so i mean but but again we need to figure out what these things are first and then what would that mean and you know maybe you know a level one guy can be leveled up to level five but he can't go to level 100 you know and there can be limitations but i don't care right now that's that's a, a detail in the game mechanics that we'll worry about but but it does go to the inherent nature of when we're world building you know to these superheroes I think this is a doing superheroes and an RPG, right? RPGs inherently are about like stats, 
leveling up, you know, those kinds of things, right? Um, customization, configuration, you know, and those kinds of things. And so I think um, these are questions that the inherent nature of superhero games sort of implies some of the stuff that we need to be kind of aware of, right? Yeah, so Max, um, so do characters become obsolete? Um, and maybe this is the level up, you know, um, So do they have a skill tree that can be leveled up, right? And that's something you need to, to kind of understand. Um, and let's look at Max's comment. Power is comparable with power of the enemy, so it means nothing if you have a level 5 and you know, level 2. Yeah, power, that's why I'm using the word power levels very, very, very loosely here. This is really about, like, you know, just knowing there's things that are better, better than others. Um, and I just had an idea and I blanked on it about, er, I hate it when I lo lost my train of thought there. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, I think the, the inherent nature of, again, a superhero and like, what, what is it, right? What are these things that are out there? Um, you know, are important for us to kind of figure out, you know, from the start, because that's inherently what a superhero game is and what an RPG is about, you know, and, um, and so, you know, um, so I think that, you know, it's going to be, you know, so, you know, it's, it's about how do they improve over time, right? Um, cause that's, I think the, the nature of, um, You know, that, that's kind of what's needed for an RPG. And I think that's one of the advantages, like what we talked about last week, where, um, you know, characters are, characters may or may not be um, in a licensed game, you know, uh, a, a superhero, like if I'm a deal with Superman or Batman, things like that, like the, they're, they're inherently harder to work with because the IP demands a certain amount of stuff. Like you have to have certain skills, certain abilities, certain things, and those those characters may not grow a lot over time. Like you don't really see like Superman getting new powers necessarily or things like that. So so it is important that we understand, um, you know, that as a new and original game, as an original IP, it's up to us to to figure out like what you know what do we want to do. And I think this is one area that we definitely have an advantage you know, over a licensed game is that we can have, you know, um, superheroes that start off, you know, kind of weak and they can grow and get better and, um, and ultimately kind of turn into a superhero. Um, and in fact, that's probably another one that kind of goes with this, but I want to put it in its own bullet point for now. Um, let's see. Uh, what do I want to call this. I want to say this is the, um, So we'll call it player progression right now. Um, and um, I'll even just put it here to make it clear. Um, so this is something that's, um, that's important to, to sort of understand again. So who is the player? What is he doing? You know, and how does he progress? Um, you know, um, So, you know, this is something that, um, and, um, you know, oops, sorry, but parenthesis to hero. So zero to hero. So, you know, this idea that like I'm nobody, right. And then, you know, um, and then I can become a superhero, right. Um, So I, oops, can't spell. Um, so 
I think I think it's more kind of interesting if we deal with origin stories. And you'll see this with superheroes as well. Um, you know, in that I think that there's something inherently kind of cool about like the fact that, you know, a lot of these people are gonna kind of go from like, I just got my powers, or I really don't know how to use my powers, or whatever that is. Um, to like, I have to master my power and then ultimately become, you know, a superhero in that. And, you know, and you can even see this in stories like just watch the like Wonder Woman 1984, right? And she, you know, Diana's on the, you know, she's a young girl and she's on her island and, you know, she's trained and playing the games. And it's obvious that she's really good, but she's not quite Wonder Woman yet, right? She's not built the skill set. So she has some. Wonder Woman is another one of those kind of gray area ones, right? Where the Amazonians do have, we'll call them powers, right? I mean, but but it's not like inherently the the same um, um, as some of the others, right? And so I think there's others that are kind of in that same boat of like, um, I'm trying to think what other characters are in the superhero universe are kind of that way where they've got just a little bit, they've got a little bit of something that makes them special, but, you know, they're not, you know, casting fireballs and doing, like, crazy stuff. Um, but they, they are, they're faster, they're stronger, you know, and they got a little bit of stuff. And then they, through heavy training, almost like Batman and some others, they, they also become elite at what they're doing. But it's kind of a combination of, call it good genetics, along with, you know, stuff. And so that's another kind of category. Um, so, Max, can players become different superheroes by mind control? Um, yeah, we can put in, um, let's put that into, um, maybe gameplay features, you know, um, so powers. And again, the point of this is we don't forget things, right? So when people have ideas, um, you know, I'd say, you know, um, we want to write them down, right? Um, so can you, you know, can you control other superheroes, right? And, um, all right, well, I think for now, you know, I, again, I don't want to belabor this point. Um, we're going to move purposely fast, like I've talked about. Um, and so I don't, we could, as a normal game designer, this is actually something I might spend days or weeks on um, to really like nail down like where they come from and what, what are they doing and a little bit of everything, you know, and stuff. And so I think that, you know, um, what we're doing here in 30 minutes or, or less, you know, kind of thing is a small slice of what that you know, actual process would be, right? Um, but don't necessarily think that in the real world, you're just going to be able to like, at first blush, go and like design all of this stuff just in, you know, an hour and like game over, like game's done, design and you move on, right? It's, it's not that easy because you're often going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to, to really create great ideas. So, so we'll, um, we will probably come back to a lot of this stuff but let's keep moving forward and um but i just again want you guys to understand i'm moving forward artificially fast right now so um so apologize if we're not getting all the ideas all the ideas in all right so max um so yes, I think right now, you know, in the, in the brainstorming phase we're in, there's no bad ideas, right? And that's that's an important part. And so yes, at some point we can weed out stuff that just isn't right for us as game designers, or just isn't right for the IP. And it could be a wide variety of reasons why we choose different things. It could just be what we like, um, and that's you know, honest reality of a, a lot of the stuff is just going to be like what we think is cool, you know, and what what do other people. Um, um, think are cool, right? And so, um, and then, but there's going to be also some like other things that we might have to be considering, like technology, for example, right? Like, 
I'll give a good example of, of like um, Superman again, which I, I keep bringing up because I think he's Superman's kind of an extreme case. Um, maybe Thor's in that case or, or whatever, where they're, they're virtually almost almost unbeatable, right? You know, they're almost godlike in that sense. And like, like for example, Superman can fly everywhere. You know, Thor, Hulk, these guys that can fly, you know, whatever. Well, from a game design perspective or a game technology perspective, we need to understand, like, are we building an open world game? Um, are we going to allow our characters to fly? And if not, because, you know, if you guys don't know, like, the, the technology involved to do open worlds and all that is pretty hard stuff. And that's not, it's not trivial to build the technology for it. And the game designs on those get exponentially more complicated as well. Because um, as soon as I can go anywhere in the game, and anywhere on the map and whatever, you know, you got to account for that, right? Because the player just can break the game and fly to the end and try to win it, right? So, so open world game design, which we're trying to not do in this game, um, gets really, really, really hard. So here's, you know, so here's a perfect example of where sometimes you have to limit yourself and, and the, that limiter might be that like, look, we can't fly or we don't want our guys to fly. And this may be a super artificial limit because we, you know, we also have planes and vehicles and it's sci-fi, you know, and whatever. Right. And so, so flying, you know, and the open worldness of this thing might be unavoidable. Um, but in the same hand, we need to be aware of that. There is a technology problem there. Um, the, the streaming of new, you know, of open worlds and things like that, you know, especially as you're flying really fast, you know, um, it, it's impossibly hard to really get, think about like even a flight sim game, you know, look at Microsoft flight sim and you're flying at 10,000 feet, you know, and you're, but you're flying the equivalent of whatever, 500 miles per hour. But then if I'm on ground, you know, I'm seeing things completely different and I'm walking five miles an hour or 15 miles an hour to run, um, you know, that's a very, very, very different technology stack and, and art and everything else that goes into those two, you know, ecosystems. And so, so I want to be careful about certain things like that and just understanding that when we're making these choices about stuff that we understand that there's, there is sometimes reasons for why we make what might be seen, what might be seen as an arbitrary choice might actually have some logic or reasonings behind it. Um... So let's see, Jonathan, how are we going to use the superheroes we collect like an FPS gameplay? So let's dive into that. That's a great starting point. Thank you. Um, and so we, let me just look really quick. Um, excuse me. With large scale. Okay, so we had, um, we had started this last week. I remember we had written a little bit of something down about this, but... Um, Man, stomach's killing me today. Sorry. Um, so the team. So let's let's talk about this. Um, um, you know, again, like. So who is the player? So, you know, th this is a, a tricky problem, and this is actually probably one of the harder problems kind of that we have to solve, and this is where some of the game mechanic kind of abilities um, or some of the game design mechanics, you know, come in into play here, right? And so, um, so this team, you know, this is, and I'll put it again, you know, thing here, this could be the Avengers or... Um, uh, Justice League. Blah. Rigor. So, um, so I think this, this is a good problem that we need to, to solve early on. Um, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, that the, um, the answer here is not really easy because it's there, there's some questions about multiplayer and other things. Um, we did decide in the beginning that we were just going to focus on single player. So so taking even co-op out for now and taking that complication out, 
arbitrarily. I mean, normally I would probably would design for multiplayer, and I'd probably have some multiplayer stuff um, going on in the game, you know, um, and and try to figure out how to work that in. Um, but let's remove that complication right now because that's that's a big rabbit hole to go down. And I think for the, for that for this particular case, let's assuming you know no multiplayer because that again is a short little rabbit hole. Like one of the reasons, quite often, I'll do a four player or four characters on screen at one time is that like it maps well to your D pad. And so you can have like, you know, characters one, two, three, and four. And then literally I can just, whichever character I want to control, I can just quickly hit a, a direction on my D pad and then boom, I flip over that, that other character. So I can have all four characters. I can directly control any one of those four. And then, um, um, and then the AI controls the other ones. So that's, I think, the direction I want to go with this. Um, but I'd love to hear you guys' comments um, about that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just making quick arbitrary decisions right now to, to speed up our conversation. Um, right. So, um, so player can control any superhero in his current team, um, and we'll say um, teams are two to four superheroes, and um, the um, well, actually, sorry, let's not call them teams. Sorry, I'm. Um, um, no, Max, I think um, controls are all real time for me right now. So we, we can talk about doing it turn based, but I mean, for right now, I'm trying to create a real time system. It's a little more complicated, but that's purposeful. Um, real quick, Jonathan, I had an idea where you could take a game like Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, um, collect all the heroes like that, and then you need to do your missions or quests. You load in the superheroes best suited. Yes. So, um, yeah, Max, I think Baldur's Gate was one of the ones I was kind of looking at for, or Dragon Age, yes, um, you know, um, now, um, maybe team is not the right word here, um, I think what I want to say is, um, And the reason I'm making this distinction right now, these are sometimes semantics, but I think this is an important, um, it's an important differentiator that sometimes you want to be really, really clear with people about, you know, when you're designing these things, right? And so remember that even stuff that seems like it's semantics can, can dramatically affect the perception of something, the design of something, or how somebody implements something. And you want to be really careful about that. So, um, the reason I changed this, um, um, so Max right now, I, I don't know these answers, right? That, I think that's what we're driving towards. Um, and let's, let's get to the, the controls here just in one second. Um, so let me just finish this train of thought and then we'll, we'll get into the, the control. So, um, in fact, I'll put team controls here and then let's just get to that just here in one second. So hold your thought. Um, so organization, the, re the reason I changed that is I, I first wanted to talk about collection. So, um, so, so what I'm going to do here is we'll call this. And we might need a sexier name for that, but whatever this case is. Um, and um, so the point of this is, is that in my mind right now, we can create a organization, you know, or whatever this is, a group that is a large. So, um, so, so in the collection, um, let me see. So I'm making a arbitrary number here, you know, in this, this, 
In fact, I'll use the, the semantics I always put in here. Um, as a quick little side note again, um, often if you're ever reading my design documents or things like that, um, when, you, when you see, when I put numbers in brackets, um, for me that becomes a variable. And I do that to kind of tell myself or other people that like, this is not a fixed number. And I'll do that often because sometimes people will, will look at a number and, you know, and just assume that it's a fixed number and they'll literally hard code in like, oh, there's 10 weapons in the game, you know, and not thinking that like the game ships with 10, but we might want to add more in live operations or down the road, or we change the design and we suddenly want 12 weapons, you know, and I actually had this happen on a game where it took us months to undo all the code that somebody had done that they literally hard coded how many weapons were in the game because they read my design doc and saw that there was 10 weapons and I thought of that as a variable. They thought it was you know fixed amount. And when we had to change the number of weapons in the game, it, it screwed us up pretty bad. So uh, this is coming from experience here that, that these kinds of things do happen. So sometimes if I know a number is not locked in, um, I will try to make sure that anybody reading that kind of gets that I'm sort of guessing on this number and that really should be a variable and something that can change over time. So... Let me see here, just thinking. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, Max. I mean, I, I, um, it really just depends. I mean, I try to just be clear to the team what are variables and what aren't, you know. So it really just depends on the team. But I generally will make a note or a table of contents that tells people what all my like notes and abbreviations mean, you know, things like that. Just again, you know, communication and clarity is really critical. And like I said, I've had multiple projects where people literally followed my design documents too closely and ultimately, you know, ultimately it cost us lots of time where they took things too literally. So you just have to be a little bit careful there. All right. And that's, you know, that can be a, a tricky, you know, d dangerous thing to get into because again, you don't want them to be too wishy-washy. You don't want to be too non-committal. But on the same hand, you don't want to be too precise where something can change over time or through live operations, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so, for example, so I'll I'll put a note here about just so just in case again to be extra clear, you know that the new superheroes can be are going to be found over time, right? And and stuff, and so. I think that's, again, so the team understands that we're going to keep adding superheroes to, to the game. <laughs> yeah, Max. I mean, that is a problem when the teams don't read your documents, and that is a uh, probably the bane of all of our existence as game designers. And that's a topic for another day about how do we try to battle that. But in short, you know, it's, it's ultimately about creating more efficient design documents that people want to read and then creating and establishing a process that has to come all the way from the C-level executives on down. That's kind of like, you better read the, the documents and not just go off on your own and do whatever you want to do. And then if a designer designs this, you know, that's what you need to do kind of culture, right? So there's a couple problems there. But as a game designer, we also have to realize that if I just give you a 500-page document, people probably aren't going to read it. So, you know, you need to understand like how to get more efficient documents to your team. So quite often, I will write long versions of these documents and then create secondary versions for the rest of the team to, to actually read. Um, and then, um, So what do you guys think about, um, so in this like 
So we're going to collect these guys, right? Now, you know, is it as simple as just I find that person in the world and I locate them and like I go up to them and they go, hey, buddy, like, sure, I'll join your team. Like, is it that simple, right? Um, do you think that the superheroes should have, um, you know, do we have to pay them maybe? You know, or is there something we have to give them? Is there something we have to do for them? You know, um, do we maybe have to, I alluded to earlier, like a reputation level? So like they won't join us until, you know, later on in the game, you know, because again, if we, if assuming we have levels of characters that are stronger and stronger, right, what, what limits me from, you know, I, I can only kind of collect these guys to start with and eventually these guys and eventually these guys and eventually the, the top guys, right? Like, you know, you don't want necessarily the player to be able to go get Superman day one, you know, because, you know, he might find Superman, but Superman's going to be like, nah, I'm busy. Like, yeah, I got things to do. I'm busy saving the world. Come back, kid, right? You know, you're, you're still a nobody. Like, why why would somebody join you? And so if you guys have any ideas around this or whatever, I'm going to kind of riff on it. But but please let me know if you got some ideas around, like, how can we control, you know, the player, you know, getting these superheroes and, you know, and then make it so that we know that we're getting better and better heroes, you know, over time and, and getting more control over them. And again, this is a little bit of a limiter, you know, so. So how does that sort of work? Yeah, so Max, it's um, a good point. Um, can you collect them all? Um Can't spell. All right. Um, and yeah, I think that's both quests. Um, the um, So anyways, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways, you know, we can control them. Um, I'm going to riff off one of my ideas for now, but please, everybody keep... Um, um, giving me ideas here. Um, but I like the idea of, um, we'll call it and actually, I would say, um, I don't even say player. I'm going to say the, 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 so we've been calling this thing the organization. So let's actually call this here to be clear, the organization. Since the player is not playing in the whole game, a single superhero, since the player is going to be able to switch between and control different characters, um, the player really for, for lack of a better definition right now is the organization, right? So, so the, the player in essence is kind of, the organization, you know, itself, and then the organization grows and gains superheroes over time, you know, and things like that, right? So, um, um, so I think the organization has a reputation, not the player, right? And so, so, and that's a good note to, you know, so really say here is, So the player is the organization, right? And, you know, um, because you can use any, any of the superheroes, right? So, so he's not necessarily a specific person. And so I think that's a, a key differentiator that you can even have is maybe when you start this, you know, this, this game, maybe it's the kind of thing where you name your organization and name your group and, you know, maybe even start off selecting two or three guys, you know, you and your best friend or something, right? Decide to join, you know, um, to start this organization, the Superheroes Club, right? And, um, and you know, you got to grow up from, again, zero to hero. So, like, that's a, that's a great little thing I want to capture here. Um, So in the beginning of the game, and again, these are just ideas. Everything's just, we're, we're riffing off stuff here, right? Um, uh, 
um, to save the world. So, so you know, um, so I think this is kind of could be kind of cute. And the reason I'm seeing you and your friend right now is I think by maybe choosing from several characters. Um, So, so what I'm doing there is I'm purposely telling the player day one, um, you know, that he's not alone, right? And so, so if we started the game with like, hey, buddy, you know, like, here's your superhero. Like, you start off playing as, you know, Spider-Man or whatever, and then you're, you know, then you might think that you're going to be that guy the whole time or something. But if we are actually are kind of that, that club or that organization or whatever, Maybe we change it around and by by naming the club and kind of knowing that that's, that club is ours, that we own the club, and then, or whatever word we want to use to describe this organization. Um, and then, you know, choosing the first couple members of the club, um, you know, then that maybe um, allows you to kind of get the feeling of like, oh, there's a couple people there in it, right? Um, you know, and so that's, that's one alternative, you know, one thing for it. Um, and then real quick... Um, Sorry, hard to type in talk. I should be better at that. Um, so, so think about that as far as like, um, you know, in an RTS, right? Or any kind of a simulation game or a lot of simulation games, you know, you've got a bunch of units on your battlefield. I've got my God view here, right? They may not even tell you like what your name is. They may not even tell you that you're there, but you're, you're kind of like godlike and you're commanding multiple things or whatever. So it could be the kind of thing where you are in essence, that person, um, you know, that's, that's at the, the headquarters, you know, um, um, Or, you know, maybe it's something like, you know, I think it's Dr. I don't know if I spelled that right, Xavier from the X-Men, you know, who's the telepath, right? Patrick Stewart plays him in the movies. And, you know, um, you know, and so, um, um, so, you know, maybe there's something there. And again, I don't want this to become metachlorians, right? I don't want this to become too thought out. I'm just kind of, I'm... This is stream of consciousness as I'm thinking about things. And as you guys are inspiring thoughts and stuff that, that the brainstorming is just kind of going in some, you know, these kind of directions, but that's what brainstorming is, right? So, um, so let's see here. So back to some um, stuff here. Um, I'll catch up on our, all of your great comments here. Um, yeah, so Max, I think, um, you know, good versus bad. I mean, I think they're, you know, um, you know, um, you know, um, so can that organization again be good or bad, right? And then, um, you know, So does this determine who who will stay or who will join, right? And that's that's a really great question, you know. And I think I'm not sure the answer right now, but I think that's something to come back to because it's um, there. And then um, um, I think Max had an idea about breeding here. Um, so I'll put it down kind of this section just so we don't forget it here. Um, So can we create technology science or breed um, you know so can we create our own basically right and can, can we roll our own here and I think that's a that's a very um, good point there okay and then um, 
Yeah, so the, the quest choices make them bad. I think that's, you know, again, all kind of part of that good or evil, um, you know, and, um, you know, um, and I do believe, I think, was it Mass Effect or, help me remember, guys, there was some, there was some certain, there was a few games that I believe did have some stuff where um, player choices would piss off certain um, teammates and they, they would leave, you know, and quit, basically, if you did th certain... I know there's been a couple games i played that did that, and I'm trying to remember what they were, um, but I know there's been some games where literally the player, to Max's point, the players um, and characters may or may not join you if they don't like you, you know, depending on who you're aligned with. I think even some, game, even some of the open world games like GTA and stuff have certain elements of that. Um, you know, where again, you know, you have to kind of be careful about the types of, um, choices you made on, you know, do you kill somebody, do you save them or whatever your alignment or whatever could affect the game a little bit and your characters kind of went back and forth. And so, um, yeah, so yeah, Star Wars Old Republic, I think had some of that as well. I, I remember. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, um, so we were talking about Claire's unlocking, collecting, you know, so again, like, you know, um, so I think there's, I think this is an important distinction is too, um, So this is, I think, the distinction of unlocking something versus being able to get it, right? So, so I think this is a great distinction we have to to think about. Um, in that, you know, in other words, you know, do we find them only in a mission? So, um, you know, maybe we encounter them, you know, um, randomly, right? You know, so this could be. Um, Semi-random, right? Where they could just be, you know, guys I bump into, we're doing whatever, we're saving the world, we bump into another superhero, and that superhero is like, hey, that, you know, like, hey, nice to meet you, like, I love what you're doing, I love your work, I'm a big fan, you know, and and then, you know, that may be all, and, you know, and he may be saying like, hey, I'd love to join you guys sometime. Well, he's now could be unlocked, right? So there could be a whole series of characters that are unlocked, and then, but the reality is, is that, you know, if we have to pay them or have to do whatever, right? So just because they're unlocked doesn't necessarily mean I can afford them, right? And so, um, so I think this is this is an important distinction of um, um. So these are both related, and, and so I'm putting them kind of together here. Um, but how much to acquire a superhero, how much to maintain a superhero. So, you know, um, So I think this is a an important part of of that, right? So like if I have, you know, 25, 50 characters in my, you know, in my squad, do they just sit there for free and and don't cost me anything or, you know, over time are these guys, you know, do I do I have to pay a salary to them? You know, am I am I paying them over time? Am I, you know, trying to work with them, you know, um over time, right? And um and so whether these guys are you know, part of my superhero group, or if you're designing another game, Jonathan Hint Hint, you know, that you might have a game where you have people that are working for you, right? Like, um, all these things that are, that are there, that are part of my team, like, are those just something I can have a bunch of them? And, you know, and I just pick out the four that I want for this particular mission, or is there a cost to me? Um, or is there a limiter? Um, 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 so, So, you know, is there a limited number of slots, 
right? Do I have like, you know, my, my, I, I use the word space, you know, it could be offices, it could be seats, it could be, you know, if I got a spaceship, because we're going sci-fi, like, you know, maybe it's, we got a spaceship, we got a space station, whatever it is, every guy's got to have his own room, whatever that is, like, you know, maybe I have to build, um, so, so the cost may not necessarily be a, um, so, so part of this could be like salary, you know, like, oh, I literally got to pay for this guy. Uh, but it also could be like, um, so need something to join, like, you know, an office, a room, you know, um, uniform, equipment, you know, et cetera, right? Um, um, so again, back to kind of where we were starting in the beginning of like, who are these things? But we're, we're basically saying, well, how do we acquire this new, you know, entity for our group, right? You know, and this could be a quick way where a guy might say like, hey, I'd love to join you. And you're like, yeah, but, oh crap, I don't have any like room, right? So now I either have to like fire somebody or I can, you know, um, build, go to my base, build a new, build out a new room or whatever, you know, that, that is there. And then that has a cost in it, you know, and it takes some time and it might have a cost. And then once I build that thing, then that guy will be like, oh, okay, cool. You got a home for me. Now I'll come join, right? Like that can be kind of fun and cool, I think. Um, you know, and um, I like the idea that um, you know, so different characters might have different needs. You know, if you're dealing with one guy, maybe he needs like a, I don't know, a special environment in his room or he needs a special place he sleeps or he needs something there and maybe you have to build that, which is a higher cost, or maybe you even have to go on a quest and find it. You know, you got to go like get that thing and bring it back to your base and then you can construct something for that guy. And now like once you have that, then he can join your team, right? And so that's kind of like, it's an indirect way of sort of like putting a cost to something, but it becomes a way of like, why am I grinding on things, right? Why am I doing certain things in an RPG to level up and do these things? And so I, I kind of like this idea. So let's play with it a little bit. Um, but please let me know if you guys have other ideas. Do you guys like this idea? You know, the, of how you like, like a superhero has to first, you first got to even just find them and be aware of them, right? And then you got to somehow search them out and then you got to somehow unlock them, meaning they're willing to join you, you know, and then early on, maybe like maybe the first five or six guys, when you get your first base or your first spaceship or whatever it is, you know, those guys will join, you know, maybe it comes with five or six rooms. So you can, you can get your first few guys quickly, you know, and then after that, it gets more and more and more expensive each time you want to add on, you know, and you, you need to somehow control that. So again, this is a limiter, right? This is, this is a, um, and in fact, I'll put a note here, you know, um, this is a collection limiter, you know, um, so this is a, you know, controlling how many, you're doing and making a cost there and then giving players reasons to go out and grind and do things and earn more money. So you may find the equivalent of Superman where like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. Like he's so flipping powerful. I want to have him here, but crap, he needs to have like the, the sweet, you know, and he's, he's a prima donna and you can actually build this in even to their personality and make it kind of fun. He's like, I only want green M&Ms in my room and you know, I want, you know, these kinds of things and only Avion bottled water that's, you know, comes from Mars. And, you know, like these are the things that I need before I'll like come join you. Right. And, um, so you could do some kind of funny stuff in there, you know, with this, but it, again, it becomes another reason to grind, you know, and build these things because you want to collect, but you also, but to me, collection comes with a cost, right? If, if collections just explore the world and find things and then I get it, it's okay. But I, I prefer the, like, I explore the world, I unlock things, so I know the potential. And then, from a gameplay mechanics standpoint, where I'm going with this is that I like the idea that, again, I want to grow. Like, I want to become more powerful. I want, you know, every one of these guys I bring onto my team gives me more reputation, you know, and therefore, you know, I may have to have a certain amount of reputation even before somebody unlocks, right? So I might discover somebody 
and then you know I have to unlock them, and I have to ultimately hire them, right, or or get them to join my team, whatever we want to call it. And and so in that discovery mode, as I'm just exploring the world randomly, I find I find superheroes, I make relationships, and I do things that make them happy, you know, and to unlock them, right. And that could even just be some guys want a certain reputation level and some guys may be like, dude, you got to go do this whole quest, you know, all these quests for me because like, you know, whatever, I, I need you to help do this thing for me. And if you go solve that problem, then, you know, maybe they're defending the world from Martians or something, right? And, you know, and that's their current like thing they're they're doing. If you help stop the Martians, then that guy's like, oh, okay, now I'm free. I don't have to keep doing that thing I'm doing. So now I'm free to join you, right? So, you know, um, so that's kind of a whole nother thing there. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. So help them unlock something to do to become their friend. Um, all right, let me catch up on your guys's ideas here. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, Max, I think he says, you know, can you always afford them? Is there a limit based on missions or how much, you know, how many you can take based on mental power or weight if they're mecha? So, yes, I think that's a, a good point. We're talking about, you know, um, things here. Um, I don't think where I'd put that. Um, that, but that is a good, um, um, so is, um, I don't know that I would, I don't know if I would limit it on mental power that I don't like to have super arbitrary gamey mechanics. This is me personally. Um, they just sort of say like, well, you can, you know, like you can only, currently have you know this thing i think once the thing once the person joins you i think they're there now the way i would do that and the way i would control that is the guy with a high mental power um would be somebody that um i can't unlock until like i have something there that he that would attract him to me and so in, the, in these particular cases you know um the guy with the mental power is might need something there, something special. He needs a special room that, you know, that helps him focus his powers and heal, or he won't join you unless you have a high reputation or, or whatever that is, you know. And so I think there's ways of controlling it. But once he joins you, um, then I think that he's, he's with you and, and, you know, and he might have his own limit, limitate, limitations on, you know, on certain things. But I think I wouldn't, um, make that a limitator on joining the team. But I think you're, you do have a good point because we have talked about, we didn't talk about today, but in the past we were talking about robots and mech and mecha. And so um, we'll call them, you know, to some races. Um, um You know, that's another thing. But I, I like the idea that, you know, there could be some other kinds of restrictions, you know, um, size. But I think this could be handled by, you know, um, So riffing on your idea here, um, so thanks, Max. I think the, this idea of, of um, you know, how do you control that? Again, I think in my mind right now, and again, you know, guys, please keep coming up with other ideas. The way I would control this again is like, okay, if I want to have, um, and um, I'm sorry. Um, so the, um, you know, I need to say create a docking bay. So maybe I first, like if I want to create mechs, maybe I first have to create a, um, a, uh, 
I don't know what we call it, an engineering thing or, or an assembly plant or something, right? So maybe I have to build them myself or maybe I have to make a partnership with people on the ground that have them. I don't know. I mean, but either way, there could be a build it yourself option. Um, you know, um, so is there a build it yourself room option? And then is there, um, you know, a deployment and storage, and then there's um, restrictions, right? So I think this is where maybe maybe weight's not the right word, but I but I like where you're going with that. In that you know maybe it's size, you know, and that you have to have again a special room for these guys, you know, that that kind of you know does something, and maybe I can build a a mech bay that's you know. Maybe it's for one mech, or maybe it can control, you know, can hold up to four or whatever. I, you know, maybe there's a couple sizes. I don't know, but you know, and then once I have that thing, then it would be like a docking bay, and, and we could even, you know, um, you know, also make a note here that um, let's see here. Um, So that riffing on that idea a little bit, um, Max, I like the idea that the um, maybe you know the mechs or whatever each take a slot. So let's just say I build some kind of a, a bay that has four slots. You know, I could have up to four mechs in there, but I might also might want to have a, a jet fighter. Or I might want to have a tank. I might want to have like some other stuff eventually. You know, and in order to do that, those also take a slot. So now the player is kind of making a little bit of a strategy thing of like, what do I want to have again in my in my base? You know, or whatever. And you know, what do I want to do there? Do I want to build something bigger or just limit or work within my limitations? Right. So so that to me again goes into this RPG mechanic of like. Hey, I got to keep leveling this thing up and getting them better and making these hard choices like which ones do I want to use, right? And each one of those creates new strategies, new tactics, new abilities, you know, and things like that. And that but we limit it all through this one mechanic. And so I'm trying to create a cohesive mechanic right now that's built around your base, and that base becomes the the key driving limiter to control how big your group can be over time and this becomes something fun to build. Um and so so it's achieving um, kind of multiple things kind of all at once, right? So let's see here. So Max, yeah, so mercenaries here. Um, let me see where that would go under. Um, I guess that's kind of more... I guess that's acquiring them. So I'll put this here. Again, a lot of these are, again, semantics about where do I want to do these things? Where do I want to have them? And, and this is one, like, I'm not sure exactly if it would be here or if it would be under its own thing. But um, So, you know, can you hire a mercenary, you know, superhero for, you know, a mission or time or you know, something like that? It's a great idea. Um, in fact, it would be kind of fun, even if it's just like, hey, this guy, you got to pay him by the, by the hour, by the minute, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, he could literally teleport in, do a bunch of damage. And then he's like, peace out, you know, and he just, he's, he's almost like a super weapon, right? And then he'd come in, do a bunch of damage or do a bunch of things, you know, and then he bails back out again, but we, we could try kind of treat them, you know, as I'll use the analogy as a super weapon, um, you know, that like CNC or something we'd use where it's just like, yeah, you want this really, really powerful thing. Like you can use it once in a while, but it comes with a high cost or has some sort of a, you know, of a cost to it. So, um, all right. Max is winning the award today for all the great questions. So thank you, Max. Um, can you have a skill that will give you for mana cost additional heroes for two to three rounds? So I think that's the same thing, you know, um, again, just whatever that is that allows you to, to bring that mercenary in, you know, over time. I don't want to go too deep into this system yet, but we'll just kind of pencil this in as like a, a TBH, you know, TBD, you know, kind of thing, right? Um, you know, and then also, um, 
I guess we're firing. So I'm not going to get deep into some of these systems right now because I don't care right now, in all honesty. Not that I don't care about your your, your question, Max. So don't get me wrong there. What I'm talking about is that as a game designer, I have to choose when do I want to detail certain things, right? And so right now, that's a detail that's kind of like, meh, I don't really care how they get fired, but it's a great point and I don't want to lose it, right? So I made sure I put it into my document so that at some point I'm going to be reading through this document again. I'm going to read this, this bullet point and go like, oh yeah, like, yeah, I forgot. We got to like deal with this whole, like, how do I get rid of people there? But right now it's hard enough to figure out how to get them on the, on the team. We'll worry about later how to get rid of them, if ever, because that could just be a UI button that just goes boink and they disappear, right? It can be that simple or it could have some other ramifications. And, you know, and so that's detail work that it's not going to affect my other design decisions to me right now. So that's why I'm, I'm skipping over that, but making sure that we don't forget it, right? It's part of the brainstorming exercise. Um, yeah, Max, I, I get your, um, I get your analogy, like with the, the mental power and I'm not sure again. So let's make a note of that as far as like, let's put that up. Um, let's see here. We had, um, so we had powers here. Um, so basically, is there is there limits, and just kind of allowing ourselves to to know what that is, and then can we create like a reasonable thing and a story and again without getting too metachlorian in our in our analysis right depending on i mean we can even have a story thing like to, to control the players right as a limiter like do we let them have like let's assume some superheroes have like crazy mental powers that are really 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 powerful let's let's assume for right now that these mental powers are some of the most powerful things in the game right and as a limiter we don't necessarily want you to stack your deck of, of characters with all mental power characters and then you just go in and you go like okay you die you die you die you die you die everybody's dead you know boink game over right like you don't want it that easy and so so i think that you know having limiters about who you can take and what you can take and all that are good to have but i but sometimes it's it's hard when you're like oh, well, you got this much power and this much, and then you get 10 points and you can only spend that. It, it becomes a game mechanic, right? Versus something that's part of the world. And so so I think that's, it, it's a very delicate, slippery slope that doesn't have a right or wrong answer. This is semantics that you as a designer um, need to understand, like, what do you like, right? What do you what do you want, you know, in, the, in this thing? And so um, I think there could be a story analogy about, you know, the enemies themselves might have the equivalent of a detector, you know, or something. And so that they would see, like, when people with these powers get together and there's too much of this energy in one place, that it tends to attract the bad guys. And I'm, I'm trying to think of, of a story analogy from another movie or game of something like that. But, you know, I can kind of imagine where it's kind of like, you know, you put too much of the superhero power, mental power in one spot. It just kind of starts radiating out and the enemies kind of know where you are. Right. And then they're going to send their guys there. And so that could be a really fun mechanic because it's like, if I have a bunch of level 10, like maximum level, you know, um, mental guys, you know, and I put them all in a room together, the enemies are just going to start coming like crazy because, you know, they, they know exactly where you're at and they're going to try to stop you, you know, and that could be a fun mechanic where you're like, I'm, I'm making the choice to go into this mission, you know, with these four guys, but I know that like, it's going to spawn like 10 X as many bad guys, you know, because they're all, they're all going to be so attracted to this particular team configuration. Right. And so, um, Maybe that's kind of fun. Like maybe it's like maybe we don't stop them, but maybe we kind of allude to the fact of like you're kind of crazy if you're going to go build that configuration. Like 
put one guy in there, put two maybe, but don't put in four. You know, the enemies are just going to be flooding in and we, we build that part of the story, right? And so that mechanic now has a, you know, a slightly defined story thing. And maybe we don't define it any more than that, but I kind of like this idea that, that certain things attract, you know, the enemies and the power. And so, um, so let's put a note on that. Um, I'll just, for now, so I don't have to look around. Um, certain powers um, so again I don't want to lose this idea as I just had it right you know and um, um, So the reason I like systems like this is, again, when you get into these weird game mechanics, right? And you get into certain mechanics where you're like, oh, you can have two of these, three of these, four of these, you know, one of that. You know, it's just like, and the player's like, why? Like, why Why can I only have, like, two of this, you know, and that? And, and, you know, and it's just a random number that a designer came up with, and you don't quite know, like, why that exists or why it was there, why that limit exists. It gets a little strange, and again, it can be fine, you know, but you have to recognize that it breaks immersion sometimes, you know, and you don't feel like it's part of the world, right? So when this, when you, when you slap a obvious game mechanic limitation on a game universe, um, it becomes a very obvious kind of slap in the face. It's kind of like breaking the fourth wall in a movie, right? Where somebody turns to the camera like, hey, you never saw a movie this funny before, right? Ha <laughs> ha. Like, you know, and then he's back to like his normal thing. You're like, whoa, why, why did that guy just talk to me, right? Like, I... Like I didn't, like in a yeah. You can do that in a movie. You can break that as they call it the fourth wall. Um, you know where like a character like talks to you as the audience member, right? Like it, it feels out of place, right? It doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, but I find that like game mechanics like that, where you're you're in this story, you're in this mode, and then suddenly it's like, oh well, no, sorry, you can't do that because you don't have enough energy points, you know, or whatever. And it's like okay, like, I kind of get it, you know, and I accept it because it's a game, but it's not clean. Um, so I do like this idea of, of drawing the enemies, you know, into the levels and, you know, and, and things like that. Um, and then um, also, let's just say that... Um, So also this could be kind of fun too. That's kind of riffing on the same idea. So what if you had you know um, certain certain bad guys just were attracted to certain characters you might bring on your team, you know? So you might have I'll use another Superman analogy. Like you have Superman, right? And you you want to bring this really powerful Superman, you know, into your into your quest in your mission. Who's going to be on your team for this? You know, one of your four characters for this mission. And like, hey, that's great. But, by the way, Superman, you know, has his enemies, the Kryptonians. And, you know, so now if I bring Superman on missions with him, the way that we could balance that out is to say, like, the Kryptonians are always, you know, looking for him. And when, when Superman's on your base or when he's there, he's hidden, right? So the, the Kryptonians don't know where he is. So they don't, they leave him alone. As soon as he leaves the shielding from your base, so to speak, everybody knows the Kryptonians at least all know where he is. And so now whenever you're on missions, um, the Kryptonians appear, right? And so that's another way of like balancing out the fact that like, yeah, I've got this really strong, like powerful guy, but you know, but if I've got him on my team, I'm going to have Kryptonians attacking me throughout the mission. And, you know, it's going to make the mission harder. Right. And so, but, but Superman is really powerful. So like, do I want to, do I want to balance that with how I want to play? Right. And I think that would be kind of fun. Um, so that could be very interesting to create these dynamics between different groups, races, factions, individuals, you know, and play them off of each other. And I like this idea of having quests and missions that are loosely defined, but then have a bunch of parameters 
um, that they would be adjusted, I'll call it, you know, or whatever. Um, and that the, I don't want to say the difficulty level of, of it, but, but something would, you know, um, could change in the course of a mission, you know, and it could be a little harder, a little bit easier, depending on who I'm taking with me. And that's both in their, in the, the skill sets, the powers and the abilities of the superhero, but also could be, you know, in the, um, you know, the fact that, like I said, additional enemies or enemy types or, or certain things might be showing up, you know, and, you know, and even like just, you know, technology in general, like if I use a certain piece of electronics or if I use a certain device, like that attracts, you know, certain enemies that are attracted to those kinds of things and so on and so forth. So everything has, or a lot of things could have, especially super powerful things, should all have a limiter, you know, by like, yeah, you use that thing, but be careful. Like, you know, the aliens are going to show up and, you know, and, you know, cause you a lot of trouble if you do that, right? But maybe the players do that purposely. I mean, one way of leveling up, you know, and if I want to start a big fight so that I can do a bunch of damage and build a bunch of skills so I can level up a character faster, maybe I want to start that fight. Maybe I want to bring in the Kryptonians because I'm like, this is going to be a really hard fight, but I know I can get through it. And like, I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to get 10x the XP, you know, for this particular battle. And I'm going to get some, some um, rare loot drops and stuff by taking on the Kryptonians versus just the, the standard robot army that I'm particularly fighting right now or something, right? So the player might be able to play that to his advantage, you know, and, and, and stuff too. So I can see this as being a really cool kind of system that I'm not sure if anybody's done something like this before, at least at this level. Um, and then also it could be, you know, certain missions may take place on certain planets or in certain locations. And again, you know, there, there may be certain, cer certain superheroes that just can't go there because they're wanted or, or like whatever, right? So there's lots of fun ways to control like why somebody can't go someplace, you know, maybe again, certain, you know, certain people are wanted, you know, even if they're a superhero, they could be wanted, you know, or they could be, you know, you're going into an area that's kind of, you know, a particular faction that doesn't like them, you know, though, you know, you're like, nah, Superman, you better sit this one out. Like we'll bring Batman this time because, you know, you're, you're just going to cause us too much, you know, attention, right. Or, or too much trouble. So it, it could be kind of fun, you know, for a lot of different reasons. All right. Back to some, um, Stuff here. Let's see. Um, that's a good question, Max. I don't know about... So it says, does your mansion get attacked from time to time? Does it get attacked more if you have two Superman in the same mansion? Um, so let's let's put this just under cool ideas um, for now. Um, so... Um, Yeah, I do like the idea sometimes of your base being attackable. And again, I wish I could remember. There was a game that there was, there's been a couple games that have done stuff like that where you had kind of like a permanent base. And then, you know, throughout the game, actually, a couple times, like that base would get attacked, you know, and it was kind of a fun moment where you thought that base was safe, you know, and then suddenly the bad guys attacked it or something. So, um, so that could be kind of, kind of fun there where you might, you know, um, um, So does the player need to defend the base, you know, or whatever. So we're basically, you know, we'll, we'll go back next week and define this a little bit more, I think, and spend some time on the base. Um, but I think the base is a metagame, right? You know, it's a, it's construction and building, which players like to do. So in, you know, RPG fashion, we build a house, right? A mansion, you know, I, and the reason I'm using base right now is I'm using a generic term. Um, I don't know if that if that base is, is on a physical planet. I don't know if that's going to be a space station up in, in, in or a spaceship up in space yet. And so, so I'm using the word base in a more generic term, you know, until we determine what it is. So just that's why I'm not calling this a mansion because I'm not sure that I want an X-Men style, um, you know, mansion or if I want, you know, something that's more sci-fi. And I'm thinking, and I'm edging towards 
you know, something that's in a space station um, and, you know, you're, you're building that out or a, a spaceship that's mobile so we could actually go from like planet to planet and take our base with us, you know, kind of thing. If we decide that we want to in the beginning or later go to multiple planets, then our base kind of travels with us as well. And then um, I designed a game um, way back called Bounty Hunter. Um, and we were doing, I was doing a similar thing that was kind of with mercenaries, but, but it was kind of designed around Boba Fett and this idea that your, your base and space could also have other things that helped you during battles, like super weapons or whatever, where that, that, you know, that base could get upgraded with like weapons that could shoot while you're like, you know, you could be down, down on the ground fighting and be like targeting weapons, you know, from your spaceship. They're coming down and blowing up really powerful things. Um, the spaceship could be dropping like airdrops down to you for new, new supplies. Um, you know, if you capture guys, it could, you know, teleport them up for you and just things like that. And so, so like having this idea of a ship up in, up in space was kind of a cool thing that I used in our previous design that I, that I think might be fun to bring back into this world. Um, so let's see here. Um, Max, any extra missions defending against Kryptonians and then you can destroy them that way by luring them. So yes, I think there is a, um, and this is where you have to be a little bit careful. Um, I'm trying to not again, make this an open world game. Um, you know, and, um, um, so, um, so I'll, so can we make missions easier by, by reducing secondary support structures? So, um, you know, so for example, in the game mercenaries that I helped design, um, there was a, this idea of like these helicopter bases. And again, this is, this works really well in an open world game, but it's a little harder, you know, depending on the kind of game we're building. Right. So it can be done. We just have to design this really carefully, but you can have something where if I'm in a particular mission, you know, there could be helicopters. If I just go straight into that mission, there's like helicopters that are dropping off supplies for the enemies. You know, they're shooting at me. They're dropping off reinforcements. You know, all these kind of things. And so the the, the, the mission's much harder if those helicopters are exist, right? So the option is before I start that mission, I run over to the helicopter base, take out all the helicopters, and now when I go back to this mission, the helicopters aren't there, so the mission's now easier. Um, so so in this particular case. Um, you can do that through an open world or you might be able to just have, you know, a map that has certain locations on it, you know, and this could be the, you know, Kryptonian headquarters or whatever. And if I take that out, you know, and I kill the Kryptonians, you know, it takes time for Krypton to send more Kryptonians there. So it may not be a permanent fix, but maybe, you know, you know, in some game time or whatever, eventually the Kryptonians return, you know, maybe it's not a permanent thing. Um, just like those helicopter bases could eventually be rebuilt um, and, you know, and stuff. But it buys us some time then to go do something a little bit faster, you know, a little bit better. And so I like the idea that you can, you can um, control the complexity of a mission or something like that, you know, by doing something, you know, there. Um, um, I'm not sure how to spell Kryptonian. Um so I'll just make a note of that. Um, so, but again, you know, easier, easier in the, um, in an open world game, right? So let's see, Jonathan has a couple of things here. Um, yeah, so the, the, um, the, the now, um, copyrighted, I believe, Nemesis system. <laughs> so, <laughs> You might be able to use it. Depends on, I think they just copyrighted the whole Nemesis system, but I'll put a note on here. The, a Nemesis-like system, you know, um, so I'll make a note just like, I also think that can be part of the, um, um, 
your reputation system as well. There's a couple, there's a couple layers, you know, in that, that, that there, but yeah, I agree, Jonathan. I like I like the nemesis system there a lot. I think there's a lot to do it there. Just between me and you right now, I'd have to go and research their, their particular new patent that I guess they got last week and understand exactly what we can and can't do. Um, it's horrible, in my opinion, horrible for our industry when we start patenting game concepts like that. Cause it's just, it, it gets really messy really fast. And I get it. I mean, people are trying to copyright their ideas, but in game design, it's just so like, you know, all, all we do is hurt the industry at some levels. And so I, I have really, really mixed feelings on patent trolling, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a, I'm not a big fan on somebody patenting a game concept, especially as soon as one person or whatever, they start doing it. And then like a thousand more companies are going to jump in. They're going to try to patent like a whole bunch of stuff. And then they're just basically pretty soon we're going to just be making a lot of crappy games because they're just like, well, we, we patented like a gun, you know, and you can't have a gun in the game without, you know, infringing on my patent. And it's like, really? Like we've been using games, you know, guns for 20 years. And, you know, it's just, and sometimes the patent offices let in these stupid ones where you're like, like, really? Like, we've been doing that as an industry for 20 years, and you just gave somebody a patent on it. That shouldn't be allowed. But they write it in such a way that the, the patent offices don't know. And so it's it's tricky. Um, so, Jonathan, don't you um, capture, remember how you defeated them? Um, you know, run into them a second time, they'll use a different strategy to defeat them. Yeah, so we, we can definitely look into that. But again, we have to be careful about that now because of the, these stupid patent laws. Um, and Max, final question for the day is, do we have, um, zombie robot whores that will attack the base? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep that right now just in the, um, in the, the base attacks and defense area and, um, um, oops, um, you know, and just, we'll figure that one out later. I think that's that's part of the whole base that we can get into next week. Maybe it's just a is a more detailed thing about the meta game, as we want to kind of call it, with the, the it's the base, the base construction and all that, which is a big part of. It's almost a crafting system. It's it controls a, a lot of aspects of our game. So maybe next week we'll talk about the the bases and that stuff because it it will have a direct effect. You'll you'll notice that I'm not talking purposely about the superheroes too much yet. Because I, I want to talk categorically about them, but I think it's kind of obvious that we're going to have a lot of different things, a lot of different stuff, and I think the bases are, you know, and these other features might affect those more. And so the more that we kind of understand about all these other systems around the superheroes helps define what the superheroes can be, right, and stuff. And so that's why I'm kind of leaving them out right now, you know, because I know that they're, they're, the superheroes are going to be a very broad topic, so... Anyways, out of time. Um, thank you all so much again for joining, especially Max and Jonathan and those that were contributing lots of great ideas. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, I hope you're finding this interesting. I hope you're finding this enjoyable process to kind of go through and just see how we're, we're brainstorming. And then, you know, um, next week, I think we'll try to get you know, into a specific example of the base. I think will be a great place to start arbitrarily, but just, you know, Again, it's just like, let's start breaking it down system for system for system, right? And, and really see like, how do we design a base, you know? And, and I want to get more detailed and more hands on and start moving away from brainstorming. Although all game design is a little bit of brainstorming and kind of go into that. So anyways, um, once again, have a great week, everybody. Thanks again. Um, and please be safe out there. It's a crazy world still. And, um, if you're in the, in the most of the U S I'm in the Bay area, so we're nice and warm. Um, I'll be going to the beach soon and the rest of you can get on your parkas and, and be safe in the snow. So anyways, take care everybody. Thanks again. And we will see you all hopefully next week. Bye now.